Not the new Danish king was at Gainsborough with all the force that had followed Swain his father, and he had made a pact with the Lindsay folk, who were Danes of the old settlement, and of landings long before the time of Ingvar, that they should fight for him and find provision and horses for his host. So it seemed most likely that the next thing would be that he would march on us, and Ethelred gathered all the forces to him here in London that he could, against his coming. At once the English thanes came in, and even Seichfrith and Morcar, the powerful lords of the old Danish seven boroughs in Mercia, brought their men to his help, and that was almost more than could have been hoped. Then too came Edric Strion, the great Earl of Mercia, Edmund's uncle by marriage and his foster father, praying for and gaining full forgiveness for having seemed to side with Swain, as he said. With these was Ulfkitel, our East Anglian Earl, and many more, while word came from Uterd of Northumbria that he would not hold back. So it was not long before Ethelred and Edmund rode away north towards Gainsborough with the head of as good a force as they had ever led, in order to be beforehand with the Danes, who as yet had made no move. It seemed as though they feared this new rising of all England against them, although all Swain's men who had been victors before were there with their new king. But Olaf, who knew more of Denmark and what might happen there than we, said that not waited for news from thence. It might be that some trouble would arise at home, for seldom did a king come to his throne there without fighting against upstarts who would take it. So he holds his force in readiness in the Humber to fall on either Denmark or England. If things go ill at home, he will go oversea first and return here. But if all is well, we shall have fighting enough presently. Now when the court of Ethelred had gathered again, it was not long before he grew more cold in his way with Olaf, and one might easily see that this grew more so with the coming of Edric Strion. So that when the march to Lindsay was spoken of, Olaf thought well to stay in the Thames with the ships, and when Edmund asked him to come north with the levies he said, It seems to me that there are jealousies already among your thanes concerning me, and I will not be the cause of any divisions among your folk. Yet I would help you, and here is what I can do. I will see that no landing is made on these southern shores while you are northward, for if you beat not he will take ship and come to Essex or Kent, or maybe even into the Thames again. Give me authority to command here until you return, and I think I can be of more use than if I went with you. So that was what was done in the end, and Olaf was named as captain of the ships and of any southern host that he might be able to raise, and Olaf asked that I might stay with him. That our Atheling granted gladly, telling me that it was for no lack of wish on his part to have me at his side, as ever of late, but that I should take a better place with the king my kinsman than among the crowd of thanes who were round Ethelred. Then he took his own sword from his side and gave it me. Farewell therefore for a while, Redwald, my comrade, he said when he went away. You have helped me to tide over many heavy hours that would have pressed sorely on me but for your cheerfulness. When peace comes you shall have your Anglian home again, with more added to its manners for the sake of past days and good service. That was much for the Atheling to say, and heartily did I thank him. Yet I had grown to love Olaf my kinsman better than any other man, and I was glad to be with him, away from the court jealousies and strivings for place. There was little of that in Olaf's fleet, where all were old comrades, and had each long ago found the place that he could best fill. So the levies marched on Gainsborough, and Olaf bided in the Thames and gathered ships and men till we had a fair fleet and a good force. Then came the news that Nut and all his host had taken ship and fled from England without waiting to strike a blow at Ethelred, and our folk thought that this was victory for us. But Olaf rode down to the ships in haste, and took them down to Eirith, while his land levies followed on the Kentish shore. For he thought it likely that Nut did but leave Ethelred and his armies in Lindsay while he would land here unopposed. Then came a fisher's boat with word that Nut's great fleet was putting into Sandwich, but before we had planned to throw our force between him and London came the strange news that again he had left Kent and had sailed northwards. We sailed then to Sandwich to learn what we might, sending two swift ships to watch if Nut put into the Essex Creeks. But at Sandwich we found the thanes whom Swain had held as hostages left, cruelly maimed in hand and face, with the message from Nut that he would return. 
He may return, said Olaf, but if all goes well he will find England ready for him. There is some trouble in Denmark or he would not leave us thus. So now all that seemed to be on hand was to bring back the towns that were yet held by the Danish garrisons, the Thingmen, to their rightful king, and to gather a fleet that would watch the coast against the return of Nut. These things seemed not so hard, and our land would surely soon be secure. Then began to creep into my mind a longing to be back in my own place again at Bears, to see the river and woods that I loved, and to take up the old quiet life that was half forgotten, but none the less sweet to remember after all this war and wearing trouble. But of all England, after Lindsay, East Anglia was the greatest Danish stronghold for those old reasons that I have spoken of, and it was likely that there would be more fighting there before Ethelred was owned than anywhere else. So I could not go back yet, but must wait for Earl Ulfkitel and his levies, who would surely make short work of the Danes there when their turn came. After that my lands would be my own again, and then what wonder, after three years and more of warfare and the hard life of a warrior who had no home but in a court which was a camp after exile in a strange land with my newfound kinship with Olaf the Viking that what should be then had gone from my mind? Will any blame the warrior who did but remember his playfellow as part of a long-ago dream of lost peace if he had forgotten what tie bound him to her? When I and little Hertha were betrothed it had been not to us but a pleasant show wherein we had taken foremost parts and across the gap of years of trouble so it seemed to me still whenever I recalled it. I remembered my confirmation at the good bishop's hands more plainly than that, for well I knew what I took on me at that time. But the knowledge of what our betrothal meant would have grown up in our hearts had peace lasted. There had been none to mind me of it, or of her, and warfare fills up the whole mind of a man. I was brought up amid the scenes of camp and march and battle just at that time when a boy's mind is ready to be filled with aught, and, as he learns, the past slips away, for his real life has begun. And these were strange days through which I had been. We grew old quickly amid all the cruel trouble of the hopeless fighting. As David, the holy king, grew from boy to man suddenly in his days, which seemed so like ours when one hears them read of in holy writ, so it had been with Olaf with Edmund and Edward his brother so it would be with Nut, and so it was with myself. I have often spoken with men who were rightly held as veteran warriors, and who yet had seen less warfare in ten years than we saw in those three. It was endless unceasing I would have none go through the like. I know not now how we bore it. So I had forgotten Hertha, whether there is blame to me or not. But now, as I say, with the sudden slackening of warfare came to me the longing for rest. I would fain find my home again and my playmate, and all else that belonged to the past. But before I could do so there was work to be done, and I was content to look forward and wait. Now I might make a long story of the doings of Olaf the king during this summer. Otter the Skald has much to sing of what we wrought. For we went through the fair land of Kent with our Norsemen and the new levies, and brought back all the folk to Ethelred. It was no hard task, for the poor people thought that Nut had deceived them by his flight, and they were ground down by the heavy payments the Danes had levied on them. Only at Canterbury, inside whose walls the Danish thingmen gathered in desperation, had we any trouble, and we must needs lay siege to the place. But in the end Olaf and I knelt in the ancient church of St. Martin and gave thanks for victory. We had avenged the death of the martyred archbishop, Elphia. Ethelred ravaged all Lindsay after Nut was gone. It was a foolish and cruel deed, and he left men there who hated his name more than even the name of Swain, to whom they had bowed since they must. Then he sat down at Oxford as if all were done, while to have marched peacefully, but with a high hand, through the old Dane law would have made the land sure to him. Olaf did so in Kent, and when we left it, we left a loyal people who would rise against Nut for Ethelred if the Danes should indeed return. And Lindsay would as surely rise for Nut against us. But Olaf, though he blamed our king for this, in all singleness of purpose went on with the task that he had undertaken. And now the next thing was to gather a fleet. If we could win Wolfnoth of Sussex to help his king, we have a fleet ready made, he said. Let us sail to his place and speak with him. That was true, and the ships that Wolfnoth had were the king's by right. 
They were the last of the fleet that England had had but five years ago and her mightiest. Now it happened that I was to see much of this Earl Wolfnuth before we had done with him, so I will say at once how he came to have the king's ships, and how it was that we must ask his help for Ethelred or rather why he had not given it freely. It was the fault of Britric, Edric Strion's brother, who had some private grudge against him, and would ruin him if possible. So he accused Wolfnoth of treachery to Ethelred, and that being the thing that the king always dreaded from day to day seeing maybe that he was not free from blame and that matter himself so prevailed that the earl was outlawed. Whereon he fled to the fleet, and sailed away with all the ships that would follow him. Then Britric chased him with the rest, and met with storm and shipwreck on the rugged southern coasts. And through the storm fell on him Wolfnoth, and beat him and scattered or took the ships the storm had spared. Britric left the rest to their own devices, and the shipmen brought them back into the Thames. There the Danes took them presently, and that was the end of England's fleet. But Wolfnoth turned Viking, and would have not to do with Ethelred after that. His Sussex earldom was beyond reach of attack through the great Andred's wheeled forests that keep its northern borders, and he could keep the sea line. So Ethelred left him alone, and Swain would not disturb him. But his help was worth winning, and Olaf thought that he might do it. So we sailed to Limney, and then to Winchelsea, and there we heard that the Earl and some of his ships were at his great stronghold of Pavencia, which lay not far westward along the coast. And we came there in the second week of September, when the time was near that the ships should be laid up in their winter quarters. As we came off the mouth of the shallow tidal haven that runs behind the great castle, whose old Roman walls seemed strong as ever, a boat from the shore came off very boldly to speak with us. But we could see the sparkle of arms as some ships were manned in all haste lest we were no friendly comers. The leader of the boat's crew was a handsome boy of about fifteen, well armed and fearless, and he stepped on board Olaf's ship without mistrust when the king hailed him. Who are you, and what would you on these shores, he asked before we had spoken. Olaf laughed pleasantly in his quiet way, and answered. I must know who asks me before I say aught. Maybe that is fair, said the boy. I am Godwine, son of Wolfnoth the Earl. Then you have right to ask, answered our king. I am Olaf Haraldson. I am a Viking, and come in peace to see and speak with your father. The boy stared at the king in wonder for a moment. Are you truly Olaf the Thick, who broke London Bridge? he asked. Well, I had some hand in it, answered Olaf laughing, for I told the men when to pull, and when they pulled, the bridge came down. They did it and I looked on. Then young Godwine laughed also, and bade the king welcome most heartily, adding. You must tell me all about the bridge breaking presently. Nay, but Redwald my cousin, or Otter my scald here will tell you more than I may. Redwald is an Anglian name, said Godwine, taking my hand. Are you English therefore? I, young sir, from East Anglian Bears, in Suffolk, I answered. Are you Edric Strion's man then, he said, dropping my hand suddenly and half stepping back. I am not, I said pretty stoutly, for I was angry with Strion's way with Olaf and with other ways of his. Ulfkitel is our earl. I, I have heard of him as an honest man, Godwine said. Come ashore, King Olaf, and you other thanes, and there will be good cheer for you. Can you steer us into the haven, young sir? asked Ronnie, who stood by smiling to himself. We must have the ships inside the island while the tide serves. Aye, that I can, said the boy eagerly, I take my own ship in and out without troubling any other to help. And with that he took hold of Ronnie's arm and showed him mark after mark, giving him depth of water and the like, while we listened and watched his face. Presently Olaf said, 
Take command of my ship, God wine, and lead the rest. You will take the risk, Lord King, he answered laughing. I, and will hold you blameless if she takes the ground before she is beached. Now there was no doubt that Godwin was used to command, and was confident in himself, for he made no more ado, but took charge, and bade Ronnie signal the rest to follow, while he went to the helm himself. Then said Olaf to me while the boy was intent on his work, here is one who will be a great man in England some day, and I think before long. And I had thought the same, for Earl Wolfnuth's son would rank high for the sake of his birth, and it seemed that he was fitted to take the great place that might be his. So Godwine beached the ships well, in the lee of the island on which the great castle stands when the tide is high, and we went ashore. The castle gates were well guarded in our honor, for Godwine had sent the boat back with word who we were. There greeted us Earl Wolfnoth himself in the courtyard of his great house. One went inside the castle walls to find almost a village of buildings, all of timber, that had grown up round the hall that stood in the midst, and that had its courtyard in stockading, as had our own house on the open hill at Bears. I think there was no stronger place than this castle of Pavencia in all Sussex, if anywhere on the southern coasts. Now it were long to say how Wolfnoth the Earl welcomed King Olaf, but it was after a kingly sort, for he was king in all but name in his earldom, shut off as it is from the rest of England by the deep forests. But he feasted us for two days before he would speak a word with Olaf as to what he had come to ask him, saying that it was enough for him to see the bridge-breaker and the taker of Canterbury Town, and to do him honour. For Olaf's fame had gone widely through all England. Now Godwine would ever talk with me, for I could tell him of Olaf, and also of the Long War, and of the Norman court, so that we became great friends. But he had no liking for Ethelred, which was not wonderful, seeing that Wolfnoth his father had not a good word to say for him. At last, when Olaf told him plainly of the needs of England and of her king, and of what he feared of the return of Nut, Earl Wolfnoth answered. Had you come to ask me to go a Viking with yourself, gladly would I have joined with or followed you? Godwine my son has yet some things to learn which a Norseman could teach him, and it would have been well. But Ethelred holds me as a traitor, and while Edric Strion is at his side I will not have aught to do with him. I will drive any Dane out of my land, and that is all. Neither Ethelred nor Nut is aught to me. I and my son are earls of Sussex. Then he rose up from his high seat and strode out of the hall, bidding us follow him. He led us to the eastern gate, and climbed to the broad top of the ramparts. See yonder, he said, and pointed eastward across the river and marsh. There is the hill where our standard has been raised time after time since Ola and Chissa drove in flight the Welsh who had raised theirs in the same place before us. There will I raise it again against Nut or Strion or any other of his men. Edric Strion is with King Ethelred, said Olaf. He is not Nut's man. He has been Swain's man, and if it suits him will be Nut's. I will not alter my saying of him. Ethelred believes in him, answered Olaf, and Edmund the Atheling believes in him as in himself. So much the worse for them, said the Earl, you will see if I am not right. I know Edric Strion over well, and he knows it, and hates me. Come, therefore, and take Ethelred out of his hands, Olaf said. Not I. Let him in law me again first. I will not go and ask pardon for what I have not done. And after that the earl would say no more on the matter, waxing wroth if Olaf would try to persuade him. So it seemed that our journey was lost, and Olaf began to be anxious to return to the Thames, or our ship should go into winter quarters. But the wind held in the east, and kept us for a while. Wolfnoth was not sorry for this, for it was full harvest time, and he sent his housecarls out to his other manors to gather it, so that he had few folk about him. Godwine went with them to a place on the downs called Chankton, where was a great house of the Earl. We parted unwillingly, 
but we might sail at any time if the wind shifted, and the earl would have him go. When you have done with fighting for Ethelred the unready, said the boy to me, bring Olaf back here, and you and I, friend Redwald, will go a viking with him. He says he wants to go to Jerusalem land some day and that would be a good cruise. Now the day after the housegarls left Pavencia, there befell a matter which would have brought them back hastily had we not been in the haven. There was always a beacon fire ready to recall them, and they watched for it even as they wrought in the upland fields, or if they were among the woods. Turn by turn one would climb to a place whence it could be seen, for one may never know what need shall be on our English shores, and I was to learn that need for arms might be in a forest girt land also, from foes at home. Olaf and I were in the ships. The wind was unsteady, and it seemed that a shift was coming with that night's new moon, and we were preparing for sailing. And from our decks we saw a little train of people crossing the difficult path from the mainland to the island that folk can only use when the tide is low, and then only if they know it well or have a guide to lead them. They say that once the path was always under water, but that the land grows slowly, and that at some time the island will be joined to the low hills that are nearest to it on the northwest. We went back almost as these folk came into the castle garth by the western gate, and met them in the courtyard. Then it was plain that there was trouble on hand, for the leader of the party was a thane whom I knew by sight, as he had been called to our feasting when first we came, and he had brought with him two ladies, who came in no sort of state, and, moreover, there were one or two wounded men among the twenty rough housecarls who followed them, and bore such burdens of household stuff as had been taken by us when we fled from bears. I had seen the like too often to mistake these signs, and I said to Olaf, Here is fighting on hand, my king. And then before he answered, came Wolfnoth out of the great door and hurried up to the party, doffing his velvet cap as he saw the ladies. Ho, oh, friend Ralph, he said, what is amiss? Outlaws, Earl, said the thane, and in strong force. This is the pest of my life, answered the Earl angrily, for no sooner are our men gone harvesting than these forest knaves begin to give trouble. When were you last burnt out, Ralph of Penhost, and he laughed in an angry way that had no mirth in it. Four years agone after our trouble with Britric, answered the thane. They have not been so bold since then, and the small fights I have had with them have not been so fierce that I must fetch you from Bosham to my help. Evil times make them bold, said the earl. How many are there in this band? Enough to sack the Penhust miners' village, the thane said. Men say that there are Danes among them, and I know that there are men who are well armed beyond the wont of outlaws and forest dwellers. Then Wolfnoth called to us. See here, King Olaf, this is your fault, you have driven the Danes out of Kent into our forests, and now we have trouble enough on our hands. Then, Earl Wolfnoth, answered Olaf, my men and I will fight them here again. But when we drew near I was fain to look on one of the two ladies who still sat on their horses waiting for the earl's pleasure. One was Ralph the thane's wife, and the other his daughter, and it was in my mind that I had never seen so beautiful a maiden as this was. It seemed to me that I could willingly give my life in battle against those who had harmed her home, if she might know that I did so. But the thane was telling Olaf that there must be some three hundred of the outlaws and others. I had forty-two men yesterday, and I have but twenty with me now, said he. Then you fought, asked Wolfnuf. I answered the thane shortly, for it was plain enough that he had done so. Have they burnt your house? Not when I left. They are mostly strangers to the land, and they bide where there is ale and plunder, in the old Penhost village at the valley's head. Then, said Olaf, let us march at once and save the thane's hall. That is well said, answered the earl, rubbing his hands with glee. We will make a full end, there will be no more trouble for many a year to come. Then he bethought him of the two ladies, 
and he called his steward and bade him take them in. At which, when they would dismount, I went to help the maiden, and was pleased that she thanked me for the little trouble, looking at me shyly. I think that I had not heard a more pleasant voice than hers, or so it seemed to me at the time. She went into the house with her mother, and I was left with a remembrance of her words that bided with me, and I called myself foolish for thinking twice of the meeting. Then the Earl and Olaf and Ralph began to speak of the best way in which to deal with these plunderers, and as I looked at the stout fair-haired Thane it seemed to me that things must have been bad if he had had to fly. It would seem that his place was some ten miles from Pavencia, lying at the head of a forest valley, down which was a string of the old hammer ponds that the Romans made when they worked the iron. And the village, or town as he called it, was in the next valley, at the head of the little river Ashbourne, whose waters joined the river which makes the haven of Pavencia. The town was very old, and had a few earthworks round it, though the place whereon it stood was strong by nature. The iron workers in the old Roman days had first built there, and they knew how to choose their ground. Thence, too, the Romans would float their boatloads of iron down to the port of Anderida, as they called Pavencia, and there were yet old stone buildings that had been raised by them. So if these outlaws chose to hold the place, it was likely that we should have some fighting, though this would not be quite after the manner of forest dwellers, unless it were true that Danes were among them. Whether there is any fight in them or not, said Wolfnuff, I will have the place surrounded, and let not one get away. That is early morning work, Olaf answered. How many of my men will you have? It depends on what manner of men they are, said the earl. All I know of them yet is that they are good trenchermen. That pleased not Olaf altogether, for there seemed to be a little slight in the words as though he had come to the earl to be fed only. And he made a sign to me that I knew well, and I thought to myself that Wolfnoth of Sussex was likely to wish that he had seen our warriors in their war gear before. Olaf paid no heed to me as I went quickly down to the ships. The men were lying about and watching the sky, for it was changing. But at one word from me there was no more listlessness, and Ronnie called them to quarters. I would that in the English levies there was the order and quickness that was in Olaf's ships. Yet these men had been with him for years, and were not like our hastily gathered villagers. So in ten minutes or less they were armed and ready for aught, and Ronnie and I led them up to the castle, leaving the shipguard set, as if we were making a landing in earnest on an enemy's shore. Eight hundred strong we were, and foremost marched the men of Olaf's ship, each one of whom wore ring mail of the best and a good helm, and carried both sword and axe and round shield. Wolfnoth stood with his back to the gate as we entered with the leading files. But when he heard the tramp and ring of warriors in their mail, he started and turned round sharply. I saw his face flush red, and I saw Olaf's smile, and Ralph's face of wonder. And then the earl broke out angrily enough for his castle was, as it were, taken by Olaf. What is the meaning of this? You wish to see my men, Lord Earl, said Olaf. I sent for them therefore. King Ethelred, for whom they fight just now, was pleased with them. Then the earl saw that Olaf tried one last plan by which to make him side with the king. Maybe he thought that this chance had been waited for, but it was not so. Therefore he choked down his anger that we should come unbidden into his fortress, and laughed harshly. Well for me, King Olaf, that you come in peace, as it seems. One may see that these men are no untried warsmiths. There is no man in my own crew who has not seen four battles with me, answered Olaf. Some have seen more. The rest of the men have each seen two fights of mine. I would that I had somewhat on hand that was worthy to be counted as another battle of yours, instead of a hunting of these forest wolves, answered Wolfnoth, seeming to grow less angry. Supposing that you and I were to fight for the crown of England for ourselves either of us has as much right thereto as nut. The Danes hold that England has paid scat, six, to their king as overlord, and that is proof of right for nut, as they say, answered Olaf. They say, growled Wolfnoth fiercely. 
King and Witten and people have been fools enough to buy peace with gold and not with edged steel. But that has been ransom, not tribute. When a warrior is made prisoner and held to ransom, is the man who takes the gold to set him free his master, therefore, ever after? Scat, forsooth. I have a mind to go and teach the pack of fools whom Strion leads by the nose and calls a Whitman, that there is one man left in England who is strong enough to make them pay scat to himself. Then Olaf said, very quietly. Why not put an end to Danegeld once for all by helping me drive out the last Dane from England? We should be strong enough as things are now. For Strion and his tools to reap the benefit? Not I, said the Earl. Come, we have forgotten our own business. Now it seemed to me that Wolfnoth was eager to get our men back to the ships outside of the walls again, for there is no doubt that had Olaf chosen to take the place for Ethelred it was already done. But such thought of treachery to his host could never be in Olaf's mind, and it was the last time that he tried to win the Earl over. So Wolfnoth went quickly down the ranks and noted all things as a chief such as he will. But now and then he waxed moody and growled in his thick beard, scat, forsooth. So presently he asked Olaf to bring two ships' crews about eight score men in all against the outlaws. Fifty of his own housecarls would go, and Ralph's twenty. And they were to be ready two hours before dawn, as he meant to surprise the outlaws in the village at the first light. Then he praised the men, and had ale brought out for them, and so recovered his good temper, and at last he said to Olaf with a great laugh. Verily you may go away and boast that you are the first man who has brought his armed followers inside Pavencia walls without leave, since the days when Ola and Chissa forced the Welsh to let them in. Now I wot that Ethelred has a friend who must be reckoned with. Nay, but you would see the men, said Olaf. I, and I have seen them, answered the Earl grimly. When we sat down in the hall that night I was next to the maiden sex Berga, Ralph's daughter, at the high table. She was very different from the great ladies of the court, who were all that I knew. I tried to assure her that her home would be safe, and I promised her many things in order to see her smile, and to please her. Yet when I went down to the ships presently, for none of us slept within Wolfnoth's walls, I was glad that there was no light of burning houses over Penhost Woods, as yet.